So let's talk Michigan football. So yeah, I think, uh, you know, I was talking yesterday, I think kind of the big thing with Michigan football, I was talking with my dad about this. I think it's Donovan Edwards, it's Alex Orgy are going to be the key guys to the Michigan football season. You know, if you look at Alex Orgy, Alex Orgy is an interesting guy. He's one of those guys where he might, I see a lot of, reminds me of Robert Griffin. And I'm not one of those guys that likes to compare players to other players I'm, i've never been that guy i think each guy is kind of has his unique unique playing style unique skill set but i see some robert griffin and there's similarities both three star guys from texas the way they roll out in the pocket the way they move around i think they're both about the same height orgy a little thicker as a runner so i see some of the rg3 not only is not only in just the story but kind of the playing style and my, my concern with Orgy, though, is release is not like super smooth. It's kind of a little bit of elongated, slower release. It's more of a, almost like he's like, it's like a charge. Like you, you wind up a toy and it really goes. It's more of like a charge and then it goes as opposed to just like a fluid, you know, like CJ Stroud, for example, fluid, quick, quick release, you know, Orgy. But I think Alex Orgy is one of those guys where I think, Obviously, he is draft eligible, but I think you have to put aside. I think that's I think that's important, you know, the way he throws the ball. But I think that's when you kind of go down that rabbit hole, then you're kind of projecting him as a as how he's going to be in the NFL. I think you need to start with the basics with Alex Orgy. Goes back to what we know about Alex Orgy, guy that's hungry to get better. He's ripped and sh- he's shredded. He's in phenomenal shape. The coaching staff trusted trusted him enough to put him in the Ohio State game. So that's what we know about Alex Orgy. Those are things we know about Alex Orgy, and those are things that project to the college level, and those are things that can win you football games at the collegiate level. Being big, being strong, having game experience, having coaches trust to go into big games, those are all things that are important ingredients to win football games at the collegiate level. So those are all things we know about Alex Orgy. So... Alex Orgy gonna be gonna be key to this Michigan season, not only just because he's not only just because I don't know he's the quarterback. He just uh, like he has like based on, like kind of like what I just said. What we know is Orgy has legit running ability, and then the coaches trust. So yeah, he's like in this offense needs to go like McCarthy, like he's. Repla- he's gonna be he's gonna be the guy who like they don't need like I think he'll have a real he's gonna bring a unique skill set other than like than or di- a little bit different skill set than McCarthy did uh, similar but a little maybe a little different uh, just because he's he's kind of that physical break tackle runner not that McCarthy wasn't but I don't think that that wasn't like McCarthy's best trait um but yeah I think actually you know more, you know the more I think about it there I think they are kind of they're more they are sim- more similar than you think just because you know they do kind of have like the s- similar releases but i guess the point i'm trying to make is alex or i guess the point i, I really am do it not doing the best job of making is orgy's going to be key to this michigan football season so they need his running ability and they need his passing ability to just be good enough so but yeah donovan edwards is going to be key they need the thing about Donovan Edwards, it was interesting. One of you guys, I said that the three key playmakers in this Michigan football team, Mason Graham, Colston Loveland, and Will Johnson, I think everyone can agree those are three, three true difference makers. And one of you guys at, would add at Donovan Edwards. And I would agree, but I also, I would also say this, Donovan Edwards needs to be more consistent. Consistency, I think consistent, like if you talk about like, I know, I, I guess this is getting off topic to relative to Michigan's success next year. But if you talk about for the NFL in, in, in regards to the NFL draft, Donovan Edwards needs to improve. Donovan Edwards needs to be more consistent, I think, to improve his draft stock. Because I think, you know, everyone, I think Donovan Edwards will still be, I think he will still make NFL people excited just because of his big playability. Like, you look at the NFL, it's a, it's a, the NFL is becoming, Limit big plays and create big plays. So I think that's why Donovan Edwards will be viewed in high regard by NFL people because of that. But I think what's really going to make his draft stock and what's really going to help Michigan, staying on the topic of Orgy and Donovan Edwards being the the game changers for Michigan, what's really going to be key to Donovan Edwards being key or for 
Michigan having success, Donovan Edwards just got to be more consistent. Like he's a little bit of, he reminds me a little bit of the Adrian Peterson thing where it's a guy where you feel like if you get him a heavy workload, you know, if you get him the 20, like he may have games where, you know, you get him 20, 25 carries and he maybe only has 60 yards, 50, 60 yards. You may have a game or two like that, but also he's a guy where he may have a game where kind of like the Ohio State game in 2022, he has some, you know, he has what he, I don't even remember what he had against Ohio State, but he had like you know a couple big like he has he could have a game where twenty carries and two hundred yards, and then he has like a a seventy yard touchdown, a sixty yard touchdown. But then there is some of the you know one yard, two yard gains. So I guess the point is, I want to see we want to see as Michigan fans we want to see consistency from Donovan Edwards, and we want to see him creating big plays and a heavy workload. So I think that is I guess. If you want to talk, be pessimistic, the negatives with Donovan Edwards, you, I guess you're going to have to take, you're going to t- have to take some of the, you're going to have to take the highs with the lows. And what I mean by that is he is a guy that there is a lot of, well, a one yard carry, a two yard carry, uh, maybe a loss of one. You're going to have to, you're going to have to kind of roll with those punches, if you will. You're going to have to kind of just accept that, you know, there's going to be some highs and lows. I think. Like I was talking yesterday, like Blake, I think why everyone loved Blake Corum was consistent. You could argue maybe even this past year he didn't have his best year compared to the 2022 campaign. But with Corum, you know, you knew oftentimes it was there's a three, it was three, four, five yards more consistently. I guess, yeah, I guess that's the point I'm trying to hammer home with Donovan Edwards. Highs, lows, too often times like a one yard carry, a two yard carry, three yard. You, I guess you're just going to have to live with those and. Accept those, but you're also going to have to be continue to be wowed and and be satisfied with, you know, in a particular game, he could give you that 60, 70, 80 yard touchdown run. So I think that's why, you know, obviously, I think it's interesting, even though all uh, Michigan fans don't always necessarily care about the NFL draft possession guy. I think that's why the NFL was still, that's why he was being hyped up prior to the 2023 season down of Edwards, just because the NFL has become more about limit big plays and create big plays. That's the thing with Donovan Edwards and versatility too. Donovan Edwards can play slot receiver. He can line him up at the backfield. He's got good hands. So versatility and ability to create big plays. I think those are things that he's going to hang his hat on in the NFL. And I think the NFL if you look at the NFL, I think Donovan Edwards, I guess, continuing with the theme of, Edwards draft projection. I think the NFL, they can kind of live with the one yard gains. They'll live with the one, two yard carries. Um, but yeah, Donovan Edwards, Alex Orge are going to be key to this Michigan season. And I think they, I think they know that. And I think if you're the, I think if you're more, I think if you're this coaching staff, I think you would, you'd sit those two guys down and let them know that. Obviously, every guy. I think Cheryl Moore, he's obviously a big team guy. And he made the point that, you know, you wouldn't want to win if you want to win a national championship, and I know NFL coaches have said this, you want to win a national championship. If you want to win a Super Bowl, it takes every single guy. But I think even Nick Saban would talk about this with his captains. A lot of times, if you want to win a national championship, there's gonna be a couple, there's gonna be a few key guys you need to to sit down and let them know that you know, like Edwards, we need consistency. We need the big. We need the big plays. Orgy, we need you to what uh, you know. Back to what we know, Orgy can do. He's a legit running threat. We need. We're going to need your legs this year. Yes, yes, you're going to make us some throws. You are a quarterback, but we need. We need your legs. We need you to run physical. You're a big physical specimen. Six three, two twenty five. Workout fanatic. We need. Your running ability, we need you to break tackles. We need you to be that guy. We need you and Edwards to be physical, break tackles, tough runs, be healthy, consistent. So Alex Orgy, Donovan Edwards are going to be key guys for this Michigan football team. And then some other – it's like I was talking about last night. I think if Michigan wants to – I think – I don't – we can talk about Michigan relative – Michigan in another national championship run, but I think – the, what's key for Michigan next year is there's going to be there's four or five guys that I named in the video last night that are going to be key for Michigan success: Makari Page, Derek Moore, Kenneth Grant, 
Giovanni El Hadi, and I'll throw in Samaj Morgan too. So those guys, El Hadi, Samaj Morgan, Derek Moore, Makari Page, Josiah. Did I already say Josiah Stewart? I guess Kenneth Correa too. So though you argue five, six guys, those are all interesting guys because they're they're guys that if a football team, you know, there's always uh, like with Michigan. I talk LSU too. LSU is kind of like Michigan next year. LSU loses some guys to the NFL, but they also have true difference makers back. Harold Perkins, Will Campbell. I say those two guys because those are legit NFL guys. It's like Loveland, Will Johnson, Mason Graham. All those three guys from Michigan, and then those three get two guys for LSU, respectively, all have project well to the NFL. All could be potentially top 10 NFL draft picks. So that's why you can really pencil those guys in as true difference makers. But I guess back to the point I'm trying to make is you always, at L, whether it's LSU, Michigan, Alabama, you always have at least two, three difference makers. But when you win a national championship, you you, ha- you always have solid to good players. Those guys have to have – they have to hit their ceiling, meaning they have to have their best season. Like let's take Makari Page, for example. Rod Moore tears his ACL. For Michigan to win a national championship, to go back-to-back next year, or I guess we'll, we'll set that aside. For Michigan to beat Ohio State again and win a Big Ten championship, Makari Page has got to have to have his best season. Josiah Stewart, another guy, edge rusher, played at Coastal Carolina for Michigan to win, it, to win a Big Ten championship. Josiah Stewart has to have his best season. Kenneth Grant has to have his best season, especially because they, there's, there's exodus on the defensive line and they need another guy uh, on the interior or on, just on the defensive line in general that can be disruptive, especially, I mean, Rashawn Benny's another guy who's pretty solid, but Kenneth Grant, can he be that guy that's really strong in the inside with Mason Grant? So, those, there's a handful of guys that are going to be key uh, for the Michigan football team. And then Giovanni Ohadi. Why I say Ohadi is because I think Michigan, the offensive line should be at the very least solid. Like, you hope it's at least good because if it's solid, you could argue that's a huge step back because the Michigan offensive line the last two years has really been, arguably been, it's been very good. It's arguably been elite. So you hope at the very, very least it's solid. But I throw out a guy like Giovanni Ohadi just because he was a pretty big time recruit. He's from Michigan, and he he has game experience. And his ability, he has abilities where he could be good, be a good player on the offensive line. So I think they need him to be a good player. So yeah, and then Derek Moore too. Derek Moore, guy that has not really been a a dominant player, but you look at the last couple of years, he's. When he he plays meaningful snaps for Michigan, I think he's started maybe a couple games. He was like a four-star guy out of the Maryland area. So, yeah, Derek Moore, Makari Page, Kenneth Grant. If you want to do something special, obviously you every year, Michigan, Ohio State, Alabama, like for like Ohio State, you know, they got some elite, you know, Travion Henderson is one of their, like, example, their elite guys, Alabama, Milrow. So every year, Michigan, Alabama, some of these top blue blood programs, you're going to have at least one, two difference makers, sometimes more. Sometimes in the case of Alabama, you have four or five. But, yeah, there's always the players. The For Michigan, there is the the solid good players, Makari Page, Josiah Stewart, um, Kenneth Grant. These are always – you always have – these guys that if you want to do something special, they need to have their their best season. Like I always fl- throw out, like Florida State won it all in two, t- 2013. I always reference the Florida State 2013 National Championship. Like if you look at that team, okay, you got, I mean, Winston, Benjamin, Devontae Freeman, and then you had Jalen Ramsey. So you had some elite difference makers. But on that team overall, there was just, a lot there's a lot of good players too like Timmy Jernigan so that's the thing you're not always I think in some cases you do have a lot of guys who are good college players and become elite like the 2015 Alabama team was an example of I mean you talk about like Kelvin Ridley Derrick Henry so you talk about difference makers and guys that became really good to elite in the NFL but that's even more rare so but in the case yeah, in the case of like 2013 Florida State, or it was another. Nat- I mean, 
any national championship team, there is that combination. It's a lot of times a combination of the true difference makers and then the good players having their very best season and just truly buying it. But yeah, I think, I mean, with Michigan, I think Wink Martindale, it was not necessarily a hire I love. It was kind of like, uh, I guess, kind of like the way to, a kind of a perspective to describe the Wink Martindale hiring for Michigan. It's kind of like in college when you get, when you take an exam and you think you failed it, college or high, you think you failed it and you end up, you look, you got like a, a 70 on it, a C, and you're like, okay. You know, I'll take it. It not to like really put Wink. I'm not trying to put Wink Martindale down. And you know, he's done some nice things in the NFL. But you've noticed like he's always a lot of times people are who they are. Like for example, if like you're an employee and you've always just been a good employee, odds are you're probably just gonna stay a good employee. Like Wink Martindale's always been a, like a solid defensive coordinator. I don't. Like that's I think too many I think college programs get this twisted. I think just be, like a lot of times they think an NFL guy just cuz he's an NFL guy, he's going to college, he's just going to become even better. Like that's not that's not how that works. That's it's it's kind of like with guys who transfer out of Alabama and they go to like a smaller D1 program. A lot of times people think, "Oh, this guy was at Alabama. He's now playing at D2. He's going to kill it at D." It's not always it's not how that works. It's not always how that works, you know. It's like they say, if you're good, you're good. But sometimes, if you're you're okay, you're okay. Like you, so, I think Wink Martindale. I think it'll help. I think this could help him from a recruiting standpoint. I think obviously Wink Martindale. You know, Wink Martindale. He he knows some things. I think he's gonna. I think he'll at least be able to make some adjustments. I don't think this is just gonna be a, a vanilla Don Brown defense. Like it, Wink Martindale. Like just being in the NFL, you, you learn some things. Obviously, the networking in the NFL, and a lot of times in the like. Just like the NFL, like a lot of times they just kind of a lot of guys can get an eye for what they're looking for. Um, so I think yeah, Wing Martindale is going to help Michigan in recruiting, but I don't I I have a hard time expecting that Wing Martindale is going to be like Jesse Minner, Mike McDonald. There's a reason Mike McDonald's a head football coach. There's a reason Jim Harbaugh took Jesse Minner. Those guys are make. You could argue they are elite coordinators, and I think Mike McDonald could be an elite head coach. Those guys make adjustments. Like you look at Mike McDonald's guy, just studied, started from the ground, been in college, been in the NFL, worked under good head coaches, worked not only just in college, but in the NFL, studied summa cum laude. You look at Jesse Minner, in college, in the NFL, young guy. These young guys are innovative. That's the other thing with Martin, Wheaton Martindale. A lot of times, Nothing against older guys, but a lot of times they kind of they they can be tend to be more stubborn, stuck in your ways. So you hopefully that Wink Martindale. I don't think he'll be too vanilla. You worry that he might be somewhat vanilla. I don't think he'll be too vanilla, but you just hope he he can make enough adjustments because just Jesse Minner, Mike McDonald. I mean, you talk about those guys just made elite adjustments. So. Yeah, I didn't necessarily love the Wink Martindale hiring, but I think it could be. I think it might be solid. I think it is a. It's one of those hires where it's like. It makes sense, even though even if you don't love it, you kind of can see where Michigan's coming from. It makes a lot of sense just because, like, if you had a like Jesse Minner, even though he was at Vanderbilt, I think a lot of people. I think you can. I think you can consider him an NFL guy. So when you had a when you have an NFL guy who leaves, you know, you probably want to replace you don't want to make too much of drastic changes. You want to replace him with an NFL guy. So Wink Martindale, an NFL guy, was with the Giants, was with Baltimore, solid with the Giants. But that, that's the thing. You know, he was he was pretty good with the Ravens, but you look at Mike McDonald, ironically, Mike McDonald replaced Martindale. In Baltimore, and then the the Ravens became the the top one two defense in the NFL the last two years under Martindale. I forget where they were. I mean, it was still a pretty good defense, but yeah, I guess Wink Martindale. It was Michigan thinking that's replaced an NFL guy with an NFL guy. This guy has experience. We've had good luck with the last two coordinators coming in with NFL experience. So I think that was Michigan's thinking. But yeah, I don't necessarily love the Wink Martindale hire. Uh, I I heard some people think it's they said it was a slam dunk hire. I don't I guess I ne- I didn't hear the reasoning. 
one guy was a guy on YouTube I listened to. I got respect for. So I, I'd be interesting to hear. I think that's why I keep referring to it as an okay hire. And I'm going to have to get off this point because I'm really rambling. But I guess uh, I really want to understand like the reasoning why it's a home run, how it's a home run hire. I guess maybe the argument they would make is we got another NFL guy and it's going to be a it's an easier transition. But I don't know how that reasoning equates to a home run hire. But yeah, we'll see. We'll see what happens with Wink Martindale. And uh, there's certainly some pieces. So I guess Mason Graham, Will Johnson. That's a that's the thing. I think the cupboard is not bears. I think that's the, I think that's why the Mar- wink Martindale will work at least for next year. Is it like, if you have, when you have two guys like that with like Mason Graham, Will Johnson, that's a really, that's a strong foundation to build upon. So I think that's, that's going to be big. Uh, but yeah, we'll see how that plays out. And then I think with me, you, the hope with Michigan is hopefully the wide receiver core. Hopefully the wide receiver core is strong. Samaj Morgan, Tyler Morris, Frederick Moore. I mean, it should be a strong wide receiver group. You saw Samaj Morgan did some nice things. I mean, he shows ability in the in the punt kick return game. He's explosive slot guy, guy that can play or guy that can play in the slot. So my hope with Michigan though is like hopefully they don't have to rely on Colston Loveland too much, like. I hope they don't try to force feed it to Loveland. I think Loveland is a guy, though. If they are trying, like they they could get away with that, trying to force feed him the ball. Like I think he could, I like I think he's a guy who kind of like Brock Bowers could be just that. You know they're gonna try to get him the ball, and he can get it. He's that good of a tight end. But I don't think I don't you you hope for Michigan they don't try to just force feed him the ball. But you hope it's kind of a lot of times. Like a lot of times, I think tight ends are making plays when the like the offense is in rhythm, and then you're kind of like like the defense is really like thinking on its toes, and then oh shoot the tight end. Like I think that's a lot of times how why the Chiefs were so deadly, especially when they had Travis Kelsey and Tyree Kill. Because a lot of times it's like, oh man, we got to watch Tyree Kill. Oh Mahomes is scrambling. Oh shoot, Travis Kelsey down the middle of the field. I think that was like I I keep picturing that touchdown catch Loveland had against Michigan State. I think a lot of that was due to Michigan State's you know, really on their toes. You know, we got to count for we got to count for this guy. We got to count for McCarthy's ability to scramble. Oh, Loveland's open over the middle of the field. So, and then even the Ohio State game, perfect example. The trick play, the uh, the the flea flicker. What was it? The flea flicker, if you will. Mullins to Loveland. It was you know Ohio State. You know, run, run. You know, Michigan likes to run. We got to watch the run. We got to. And then, oop, flea flicker. Oop, Loveland open down the sideline. So, that's the thing. Can Loveland? Could Michigan succeed to a degree force feeding the ball to Loveland? Sure. But I think it's going to be, I guess, I'm giving you the long answers for, I hope Michigan is fairly balanced and I hope that their offense stays in rhythm. So that's my concern, I guess, with Orgy. or I guess that is the concern with the Michigan offense is hopefully Orgy stays, hopefully Orgy at least shows enough ability as a passer where it is, because like, you know Michigan's going to, I assume under Moore, they're going to want to run the ball next year a lot, but you hope that Orgy is a good enough passer where that rhythm can really be deadly, and it can equate to Loveland getting open, big plays within the offense, some you know some nice setup screens and, and quick throws to Morgan. So, But yeah, Loveland's so good. Loveland's such a talented player. A lot of people said last year that he, outside of Brock Bowers, he's the best tight end in the country. And I don't, and, and they mean, like, I think that is a, an ultimate compliment, too. So I don't, you know, sometimes when you say a guy outside, like, sometimes when you say a guy is the next best player outside of this guy, it's almost, it's not necessarily like a put down, but it's, it's not necessarily like a, a very high compliment. I think in that case, I think it was a very high compliment because Brock Bowers, like you see Brock Powers, top 15 pick in the NFL draft, going to be a very good tight end and got a chance to be one of the next elite tight ends in the NFL. So a lot of people saying that outside of Brock Bowers, Colston Loveland was the surefire best tight end. I think that was a very big compliment. And I think Colston Loveland certainly is the best tight end in college football next year. And just a, a guy that's hungry too. 
small town in Idaho, three star. I think he's got, I don't, I guess I haven't heard this, but I assume he's got somewhat of a chip on his shoulder. I would hope so, being a, I would, if I was him, I'd be a little bit pissed off. He wasn't, you know, he didn't have a lot of offers outside of Michigan, three star guy. I mean, you look at him, workout fanatic, uh, kind of like Orgy. So I assume he's a, He's a hungry, chip-on-his-shoulder guy, which every guy should be, but I think especially being a three-star guy who wasn't getting as much notoriety as Loveland. But, yeah, I guess I love I love Colson Loveland. He's he's one of my favorite players to watch. I think, you know, I talk about him and Will Johnson, Mason Graham, but that's the thing. you got to talk about stars, and I, I love all three of those guys. There's some of – they'll go down as, you know, some of my three favorite players to ever play at Michigan. Yeah, Mason Graham, so good. Mason Graham, I guess we'll talk about Mason Graham a little bit. So, yeah, Loveland. Like, Mason Mason Graham's one of those guys where I don't think, I think when NFL teams evaluate him, I guess we'll talk about, I'll talk about his NFL draft projection, then we'll talk about how he can impact this Michigan football team because that's what you guys care about. But I think relative to the NFL draft consideration, I think the thing with Mason Graham is, he he's a guy that just he understands how to play football, and you you may be thinking like, well, duh, but some guy some guys just have a you know you ever it's kind of like uh like you ever play I know this is kind of a silly analogy, but you ever play pickup basketball with some guys that just maybe they didn't necessarily play at a big time college or in the NBA, but they're just like have a incredible basketball IQ. They just know when to pass. They know what they know how to get open. Mason Graham's kind of like that guy. Obviously he's a better, obviously he's better than that. Cause he's going to play in the NFL. He's not just going to be a guy that <laughs> plays pickup football, but he's a guy that just un- like, he understands leverage. He was a wrestler in high school. He understands how to get off of blocks. He, un- he can read plays quickly. He just has a kind of a, a sixth sense um, for just for, for how to make plays. And that, that's why I love Mason Graham. Fantastic football player. Not the, you know, kind of just going to probably get that label a little bit. Not the biggest guy. Maybe not the, I don't even know what his weight room numbers are, but not probably, he doesn't seem, doesn't look like the the strongest guy. It doesn't even have the best play strength. But yeah, he just had, like that play he had, like to sum up Mason Graham's success as a football player, like you look at that play he had against Alabama. He read that play, knew how to, to just get off that block, knew how to just evade that block quickly and just make a tackle for loss. A big time play, big time moment. So that's what big time players do. So big time plays and big time moments. So that's Mason Graham, just a really good football player, really good athlete too. So yeah, phenomenal wrestler in high school. So yeah, I love Mason Graham. And then, but yeah, I think, you know, the linebacking core will be interesting for Michigan. I think, uh, Ernest Hausman. Ernest Hausman will be big. Jay Sean Barham, I got to watch some of his tape. But yeah, losing the kid from Belleville hurts. I really like the he would he would have been a freshman this year. His name's escaping me. But um but yeah, he he would have really helped them at linebacker, but you feel like with Michigan, you know, Hausman, Barnum, those two guys, like if the if the Michigan defensive line plays the way it plays up to its potential you feel like the linebacking core should be all right so but yeah but yeah i mean as far as the schedule is concerned for michigan it is tough i mean oregon usc texas washington very tough schedule ohio state too this year at ohio state but it kind of goes back to, I mean, if if you're good, you're good. So I think if Michigan is that good of a football team, like if they're a very good football team, you argue last year they were a, I would say last year they were an elite football team. But if you are at the very least a very good football team, you expect to win those games. So I think that's the case with Michigan. I think they should expect to, like even, like how many of those games are they going to be underdogs? Like I think against, especially I think even against, like even against USC, Oregon, Washington, Texas, those are going to be tough games. Like it's not going to be it's those wins are going to be earned. I think Michigan should go into those games. Well, it depends on what happens. But they, I think you, they should expect to win those games. So even though it's going to be tough, like especially week two. I know it's at home, but Texas, you got 
Texas got Quinn Ewers, Sarkeesian, a good football coach. Texas was in the playoffs last year. Almost actually met up with Michigan. If they if they would have defeated Washington, Michigan, we would have got a Michigan Texas national championship. But yeah, that that's gonna be a tough. It'll be a tough game for Michigan. And um, but yeah, I think Michigan should have the confidence from not just based off of what they did last season, but what they've really established the last couple seasons, they should expect to win those football games. But yeah, it is, it is kind of like the, the dream season for Michigan football. I mean, you play in Texas, USC, Washington, Oregon, and then add Ohio state, even Michigan, you still play Michigan state too. So yeah, dream season, for Michigan football, and uh, it's it's going to be fun. But yeah, I mean it. It's going to be very interesting how Sharon Moore does. Like, it's always like I, I've said this before, but I think how Sh- how Sharon like Sharon Moore his legacy at Michigan. I think if he go say he goes on to be a really another really good head coach in Michigan football history, I think that uh, I think. Where that's going to be established is probably two, three years from now. Because a lot of, like you see, next the next couple of years are going to be kind of, even though Harbaugh's gone, it's going to be kind of a continuation of the Harbaugh era. It's kind of like when Harbaugh left Stanford, David Shaw kind of sustained what Harbaugh had built. You saw eventually it had fallen off. But like Oregon too, like when Chip Kelly left, Mark Helfrich continued what Chip Kelly had built. So I think Sheryl Moore, even though they do lose a lot of guys, to the NFL, they do have some guys back where they can, they can kind of continue the. That's the thing. I think when you have guys that have been in a program under a coach, they kind of like the years that follow. They still, can, they still kind of remember that re- that culture that was set in the years two prior. So, I think probably two years from now, three years from now is where we really find out a lot about Sharon Moore and what program he's trying to establish. But yeah, I think Michigan. As far as next year, I think even if Michigan doesn't, like let's say like it's a let's say next year it's a eight and four, nine and three season. They don't beat Ohio State, but say they do get like a win some wins against maybe they do get a heart, like a win against Washington, a win against Texas. I think that that's kind of like you know, okay, that's it's kind of like all right, that's that's not bad. Let's see, let's see how you follow it up though. But I think, yeah, basically the main point is I think Michigan's going to be fine next year. I think they'll be fine two years from now. I think it's the, I think when you look at the 20, the 2026 season is going to be very telling for, for this Michigan program. And are they going to continue to trend in the right direction? Or are they going to slowly take steps back? Cause it's like, I always use like when, when you talk about getting better or getting worse, you always, it's ironically, you can reference the coach from the, the you can reference Bo Schembeck, our former Michigan football coach. You're either getting better or you're getting worse. So that's the thing. I think even if Michigan takes a step back, I think, or if, even if the record's not as good next year, I mean, obviously it'd be, it's going to be hard to beat 15 and 0, but even if they are like nine and nine and three, 10 and four, 10 and three, you can really say that, you know, maybe maybe we didn't take a step back relative to how tough our schedule was. But yeah, I think uh you could I guess you could argue with Sharon Moore 2025 will be pretty telling, especially if they take a step back next year because he, and then in 20 cuz it even cuz then in 2025 if they take another step back, then you could be like, man, is this going to go off the rails or are we going to continue to trend Backward, we're going to continue to trend in a negative, in a you know a, a bad or in a negative direction. So I think these next two years will be telling. But 2026, like 2025, will be telling. But I think 2026 will really say a lot about Sharon. We'll find a lot about Sharon Moore, and we'll find a lot about this Michigan program under the Shro- under Sharon Moore. But yeah, I think, and then Michigan, and Michigan recruiting, you know, Michigan recruiting has been okay, but like I think Michigan, like they have, like you look at some college programs, just have guys that just know how to evaluate players. Like even when, um, 
like Michigan State, for example, like even under D'Antonio, like they just they were they just knew how to find these kind of under radar guys from Detroit. And even with Clemson a little bit, like Clemson, people forget even Clemson when they won it all in 2016, 2018, they weren't necessarily landing surefire. I forget exactly what the rankings were. I think Clemson was still in the top 15, top 10, but you know, they they land some guys like Watson, Lawrence, but they weren't necess- they weren't like Alabama where it was or it weren't like Alabama, Nick Saban at Alabama, or Jimbo Fisher at Florida State, where it was several years of a top two, three class, number one, and then number one class. It was, but it was good classes, and then you just, and then talk about just hitting on guys. You know, that's what Michigan's recruiting class has been the last three, four years. It was, you know, good classes. I forget exactly, you know, what were they, what, what they finished in the 21 class, like 20th overall, 22nd. But you land guys like Donovan Edwards, J.J. McCarthy. You you get difference makers, and you get the guys that you wanted. I know in that class they did miss out on Worthy, but and then in, in the twenty two class, I mean, you hit you get you, Will Johnson, Loveland, Mason Graham, all three of those guys. Like that's the thing. Like that's why like you ha- you kind of kind of have to take recruiting rankings with a grain of salt, just because like yeah, you might have like. Some some teams can get a top fifteen, top twenty class, but they can get guys that they really wanted, and they get guys that they're confident are they're going to be true difference makers, and they become true difference makers. And then you can have a class where, like even Alabama, like obviously Alabama hit on so many guys, but Alabama had I forget what class it was, but they've had one or two classes, not a lot under Saban, because a lot of them were top five and they found legit guys, but they had a few classes where it was like they finished third or fourth, but man, they, a lot of guys, you don't want to say they necessarily like whiffed on, but there are a lot of guys that just, you know, didn't really live up to, to their billing, you know, high four star, high five, five star guys. But yeah, I guess that's why, I guess what I'm trying to make is, or the point I'm trying to make is you should stay optimistic for Michigan football, even if they're not landing top 15, top 10, top 15 classes just because Michigan's like Michigan's kind of earned that nod, especially winning the national championship, that they know what they're doing, like they know how to find these three-star guys like Loveland or these four-star guys like Mason Graham, who are going to be really good players for them. Like I think that that like that's why like Will Johnson, five-star. I think that's why Michigan. You talk about how Michigan won the national championship was like if you. Like that's why that's how you win a national championship if you don't have a top five class. Michigan showed it is a textbook example of that. It just it really basically comes down to okay, we're not gonna get we're not gonna get multiple five star guys, and we're not gonna get a ton of high four star guys. But of the three star and four star guys, and then in the case, like staying with the 22 class, in the one five star guy we can get, boom, we hit on him. Will Johnson, that's our guy from Michigan. But then, okay, we had, then we have our pick of all these three star, four star guys. Let's get guys we like Mason Graham, four star guy, and then the Colson, and then let's find that under the light, radar gem. So, Michigan, the 22 class, not just. Well, it wasn't just great execution because they got three difference makers. It was great execution in the sense that, boom, we got the five-star guy and we hit on the five-star guy. We got the four-star guy from California that we really that people liked, and we got him. We got him to come all the way to Michigan, Mason Graham. And then we got Loveland, a three-star guy, kind of under the radar, not a lot of offers from Idaho. So you hit on the three-star gem, you get the four-star guy you really liked, and then you hit on the five-star guy that everyone wanted. That's the te- as a textbook example of how you make the most of a recruiting class that is not a top 10, top five class. It's a textbook example, and it just it's a, it's a testament to your, scout, to your scouting department. So hopefully Michigan's scouting department can really continue to do that. So... But yeah, it just it builds so much tr- it builds so much trust too in in the fan base when you, when you're hitting on all these recruits, and that's the thing. Even under, uh, I guess that was even kind of the theme under Brady Hoke a little bit. It wasn't necess- some of their highest recruits didn't necessarily work out. Like Derek Green is a five star guy that I guess you know didn't necessarily work out. But some of their better players, like even under Brady Hoke, like I know Jabril Peppers was really good. He was a five star guy, but some of their best players under Brady Hoke and even under Harbaugh haven't necessarily been like their highest recruited guy, like the 
you know, the most big time, even like a big four star guy. So, um, but yeah, I think, uh, like, was it like Jordan Lewis too? Obviously he was a, he was a Brady Hoke crew, but he played under heart. I think Jordan Lewis was just like a three star guy. I don't think he was, but yeah, that's kind of my, kind of my point. Like Michigan, I think like Michigan has done kind of, they kind of, like what Michigan State did under Mark D'Antonio, finding the under radar guys mostly from the state of Michigan, like the Detroit area in Ohio. Michigan did that, but they took it to another level. You know, finding under the radar guys, but then also finding mix combining it with, you know, Michigan's national recruiting brand and then finding the elite guys. So yeah. Two thousand yeah, the twenty one class, twenty two class. 21 class with McCarthy, Donovan Edwards, and then the 22 class, just textbook examples of finding, of just, you know, finding hidden, finding three, finding gems, and then getting guys you wanted that are high recruits. So, yeah, J.J. McCarthy was five-star guy that most people wanted in Michigan, and Michigan got him. And that was a testament to understanding kind of the mental makeup of a player, too. You know, understand finding out that JJ McCarthy is a winner too, because I actually wasn't necessarily wowed away by JJ McCarthy's ability. I think maybe that's why he wasn't like he was. Definitely, a lot of people wanted him, but I don't think that's why. Like maybe Alabama and Georgia and Ohio State were were like bound and determined to get him, even though Ohio State wanted him as well. I think it's because he necessarily. You know he doesn't like he's his arm's strong, but I don't. You don't watch him, and you're in. I don't think like it sounds like I'm taking away from JJ McCarthy. I love the guy, but I don't. I necess. I was at least for me personally. I know others were. I wasn't necessarily wowed by him. But there's some things like Mel Kiper was talking about when they were breaking down his NFL draft projection. There's some guys that just have the, you know, they use the term it factor. The guy just or the mental makeup. You know, the guy just the guy just is a winner. And that's you hear that expression "winners win" in any environment. Well, JJ McCarthy is just he is a he is a winner, and in any environment, whether it's the NFL, whether it's high school, Michigan football, whether it's pickup football, JJ McCarthy is going to win, and he's gonna, and if he's not winning, he's going to figure out a way to win. So he has that me, that mental makeup. So Michigan, a good job with their scouting department to find that guy, uh, find a guy like that, and figure out what he's ma- what he's made of mentally. And figure out that this guy projects to a winner, not only at the college level but in the NFL level, and is a guy that if we're going to build something special, is the quarterback we want to put out there. So, good job to Michigan scouting department uh, in that regard. Yeah, I wish I had these in front of me. I don't have my laptop in front of me. Uh, a lot of this I can kind of go off the top of my head, but I can remember Mich- some of. I don't remember. I don't. I wish I don't remember the Michigan's recruiting class as well as well as I should, but. Um, but yeah, and then even like Samaj Morgan too, is another great, ex- like Samaj Morgan, you talk about another, I think was Morgan become a four star. He was either a three star, four star guy, but I follow, like I followed him closely and he was a, he's a three star guy, but in, he was really viewed highly in, relative to the state of, in the, in the state of Michigan. But yeah, Samaj Morgan, another perfect example of Michigan, not necessarily, I, I wouldn't say a hidden gem, but a guy that was not as, highly sought after but michigan they wanted him from the state of michigan to west bloomfield kid michigan wanted him they got him he committed to michigan never looked back and tremendous freshman season he has a chance to build off it so so maj morgan another guy too where he's talking about michigan getting a getting a guy they wanted a guy that was not necessarily yeah not necessarily like all the big time blue blood programs wanted him but they got him, and he's got a, and he made an impact as a freshman. He has a chance to, as a true sophomore, take another step and really be show why um, he's going to be one. Of, why he's one of the best receivers in the country. Like I think Samaj Morgan could take that step this year to show people that he's one of the more explosive wide receivers in college football. So I got to wrap with that, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Stay tuned for more episodes and clips from the Brand Partial Show. Till next time, peace.